everybody knew where you were. The May session of the Thousand Oaks Council on Aging is now in order. Commissioner Loomis, will you lead us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, please? Yes, sir. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Francine, will you call the roll, please? Absolutely. Commissioner Borgine. Here. Commissioner Fotheringham. Here. Commissioner Grimm. Ready for... Oops. Commissioner Healing, uh, absent. Commissioner Loomis. Para servirles. Commissioner Norkin. Commissioner Shentes is absent. Commissioner Sudan. Here. Commissioner Wing. Here. Thank you. All right, that brings us to public comments. Um, our first public speaker is Elise Klusman. Elise. Either one? Is this on? Yeah. Uh, Good afternoon, my name is Elise Klusman and I'm here to speak to you about our Community House of Hope, which is the new uh, end of life care facility on Los Arbolos Avenue in Thousand Oaks. We are now open, we have now had our first residence and we have had um, two, if there's, if I can say it, lovely, lovely deaths. People who have in fact been um, cared for as they, as they had their last days in a loving and comfortable uh, house where it went well. And I urge all of you to take a look at what's going on. Please go to www.ourhouseofhope.org and I have some flyers over here on the table for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elise. Brenda, Brenda Birdwell. Good afternoon. I just keep coming back like a bad penny, don't I? <laughs> My name is Brenda Birdwell and I'm a senior advocate for senior concerns. I'm going to get the important stuff out of the way before I forget about it. Um, my number is 805-495-6250. I share an office with Betty Berry at the Goebel Senior Center, which is at 1385 East Jans Road. The Senior Concerns Adult Day Center is at 401 Hoden Camp, and the number there is 805-497-0189. Um, our website is www.seniorconcerns.org, and all of the wonderful things that I'm going to be telling you about are on our website. So you can call our, any of our numbers or the website to get this information recapped if you don't remember it all. So the first thing that's coming up that I'm very excited about, I'm excited about all this stuff, is that this Sunday is the Miss Senior Conejo Valley Beauty Pageant, and I'm going to be a judge. That's gotten me more notoriety than anything I've done recently. <laughs> there was an article in the paper about one of the contestants, and it listed me as a judge from Senior Concerns, and I got phone calls from people I haven't heard from in five years. So anyway, that's this coming Sunday. And this coming Tuesday, which is May the 8th, um, is the last of our caregiver series for this session, for this fiscal year. And it's called When All is Said and Done. That will be at our Adult Day Center at 401 Hoden Camp from 4 to 530. And for those of you who've been able to participate in the caregiving series so far this year, it's been very popular and very well attended. And we're going to do the same sorts of things again next year. It's going to be a whole series on the caregiver once again. So that's exciting. Um, also on next Tuesday, which is the 8th, uh, there's another, um, an encore performance of the panel, I can't, uh, I can't Retire, I Can't Afford It. And that panel was comprised of Betty Berry, who's our senior advocate, Elise Klesman, who spoke just a few minutes earlier, Marianne Knight uh, from California Senior Living, who put the program together, and Jim Eckley from KIPP Financial Services. Um, the first one was full with a waiting list. The, there was a waiting list of over capacity before the second one was even announced, so it was a very popular, Bob was there, I believe, it was a very popular evening. Um, and then on May the 9th, which is Wednesday, Betty's having her monthly uh, sem May seminar in Westlake. That'll be at 1.30. And this is about assessing your home to be able to stay in your home to age in place. 
On May 31st is the Spirit of the Community Awards at Baxter, and we were very fortunate to be awarded the Nonprofit of the Year for this year, Senior Concerns. Um, thanks to our friends here at the city for the nomination. Uh, so we're very excited about that, and that uh, ceremony is open to the public. If anyone's interested, you can go online to sign up for that. That's also on our website. We have ongoing brain fitness classes now at the Goebel Senior Center. Uh, there's private one-on-one -on -one DACOM computer sessions at Senior Concerns, and there's also session. There are also sessions going on in Agora, Calabasas, and Simi Valley, with the possibility of some in Moore Park. So those are four-week sessions um, that are ongoing, and then there's private one-on-ones that you can do at Hoden Camp. I'm going to be teaching a healthy living class starting June 7th, from June 7th to July 17th. Some people here have taken the class and some were enrolled in it. I'm co-facilitating that with Steve Lehman from SCAN. It's a six-week program, two and a half hours a week, that helps people uh, cope with chronic diseases. And that could be anything from diabetes, high blood pressure, stress. I'm sure no one here has ever experienced any stress. Um, so it's a really, really rewarding class. I think the people who've gone through it would, would agree with that assessment as well. Um, the biggest thing that I'm here to talk about, and my bosses are fighting over who's going to fire me first, is the Betty Berry Brigade. The Love Run is coming up on June 3rd. The Love Run is benefiting Meals on Wheels for Senior Concerns. The Senior Concerns Meals on Wheels program is for Thousand Oaks and Newberry Park. And it's the only program of its kind that delivers two freshly prepared meals every day except for Christmas. Most Meals on Wheels programs have frozen food that's delivered maybe three times a week. So because we insist on delivering freshly prepared food, we get zero government funding. Um, and what we're finding in this economy is more and more people are needing the service and we don't turn anyone away who can't afford to pay for it. So this year, Betty has agreed to lead the One Mile Fun Walk because in the past only 5% of people in the Love Run have been over 65 and we know that that's not indicative of our community. So I am counting on every single one of our council members here to participate in some form or fashion. My eyes are on you. Um, <laughs> Um, anyway, it's going to be it's going to be a great turnout. It's going to be a fun event, and it's for a good cause. And for those of you who don't know Betty, you should read her weekly column in the Star. If you don't get the Star, she's also online. So she has a weekly column on Wednesdays. Andrea Gallagher has a bi-monthly column in the Acorn called The Other Side of 50. And I think I've just about bored you guys enough. So thank you very much. One one quick question: uh, What's that number again? Eight zero five. Four nine five six two five zero is my number, and the number for the Senior Concerns Facility at Houghton Camp is eight zero five four nine seven zero one eight nine. And again, everything is on our web www.seniorconcerns.org. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Brenda. <laughs> and now it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. He's the author of 16 books, including two international bestsellers, The Acorn Principle and Relationship Selling. He has also been inducted into the Professional Speakers Hall of Fame. He is a veteran of over 2,700 international worldwide speeches. He is also the past president of the National Speakers Association and is currently an advisor to Cal Lutheran University School on Management. He's a civic leader, a Thousand Oaks residence, and a rock and roll singer. He rides motorcycles, runs mountain trails, and coaches executives to become better speakers and business leaders. Speaking on living well, aging well, let's welcome Jim Cathcart. Jim? Well, good afternoon. You, you notice a little different prop than you're used to from your speakers, huh? When I get older, losing my hair. Any moment now, will you 
still be sending me a valentine birthday greeting bottle of wine if i been out till a quarter of three would you lock the door will you still need me will you still feed me when i'm 64 well that's thank you thank you that used to be something I looked forward to. Now it's something I look back on fondly. <laughs> I'm currently 65, and uh, I'm, I'm sort of the uh, stereotype, that you know, or maybe even the prototype that they ran through the system for what baby boomers would be. I was born in 1946, first year of the baby boom. I graduated high school in 1964, last year of the baby boom. So anything that happens to me, is going to happen to 78 million other people real soon. Okay, so I, what I've found is it's it's really fun to reflect back and document kind of the transitional moments. There are little moments where your attitude shifts, moments when your body parts start going offline, moments when when uh, you change the the kind of goals you set and other things like that, where where you start enjoying some things you used to ignore and and not enjoying other things you used to savor quite the same. And uh, the, the other night, my wife Paula and I got invited to a birthday party of a good friend. And the theme of the birthday party was seniors prom. <laughs> Isn't that clever? And the odd thing to me was I fit right in. I felt right at home. I mean, these were my kind of folks and I was having a ball there. And we played a little rock and roll music and sang some oldies and, and some favorites and, and just had a good time. But I think whatever age you're at is the age you ought to be savoring. You know, th that's your reality. If you're 94 or you're 24 or whatever in between, that's your reality. That part you cannot change. The one thing you can change is how well you're living. You say, well, it's easy for you to say, you know, you don't have the problems I've got. Well, true, and you don't have the problems I've got, and I haven't brought all mine up yet, so, you know, we're not going to do a comparison see who wins or loses. You know, can you bottom this? Huh? Huh? No, you think that's bad. <laughs> I think I'm winning, you know. No. No. I believe the simple fact, this is getting a little philosophical maybe, but I believe the simple fact that you're alive is proof there's still more work to do. I believe, I believe there's a God, and I believe we were, we were created intentionally. I, I don't think we are biological accidents. I think we were intentionally created. And if we were intentionally created, then there was something in mind for us. Now, let's assume for a moment that you are the creator. You're in charge of creating all things, all right? And you want to create things so it goes the way you intended it to go. Wouldn't you design most all the people a little different from the other people so that there'd be a multitude of combinations possible and you could achieve virtually anything that, that was worth imagining, okay? Wouldn't you also make it so that whatever you wanted her to do or him to do or her to do or whatever would be the thing they were drawn toward instead of repelled by? So people say, I don't know what I, you know, what, what should I do with my life? What do you love? What are you concerned about? What lights your fire? What just ticks you off and you think it ought to be fixed? That's what you ought to do with your life, I think. Now, obviously, all this is my opinion, so you can accept or reject this point of view. But I believe that it's our job to live fully. And if I don't live a full, abundant life, if I, don't, if I take parts of me that ought to be getting attention and ignore them, I'm denying everyone else in the world the benefit that would have come from my pursuing that. If it's my love of music, then I'm denying everybody else the enjoyment of music that would come by my getting good at it, okay? Not, not assuming I already am. But if I explore my love of music and I start cultivating that and developing the skill, regardless what point I'm at in my life, then I'm able to bring joy to other people, okay? And the same thing's true for intellectual capacity or physical skills or interpersonal things. Think about your life as having meaning and purpose. I was in Atlanta. This was, gosh, many years ago. I've been traveling as a professional speaker now for 36 years. So I've been all over the world. I've spoken at every kind of convention you can conceive of, including, talk about off the wall, the Association of Wiping Cloth Manufacturers. 
there are enough party. Yeah, there are enough of them to form an association and have a convention. That I, blew my mind. But they're there, and they make. Honest to gosh, they make you know good quality, different types of cloths that are used for various purposes. Okay. Anyway, I've spoken at all these different conventions for financial groups and other types of groups over the years. And I was in Atlanta several years ago in the airport uh, food court. You know, in the, the concourse in Atlanta, if you've been there, it's just a madhouse of people. All these millions of people coming through there every month. And the food court is always full. And I was in the food court, and it was a busy morning, and so I decided to just get a quick little snack, a muffin and coffee, and stand over to the side and watch the people. And there was this guy bussing tables. And of course, every table was full, and there was trash everywhere, and, you know, just what you would imagine. So he's over there, and he's like this. He's about half as tall as he could have been, and he looks depressed as can be. His face is a foot long. And he's just kind of dragging himself from table to table. And he'd pick up a tray and he'd get the trash. He'd never smile. And he'd throw the trash in there and he'd wipe off the table. And he'd go over and he'd dump the trash and then he'd come back. And <laughs> I'm getting depressed watching this guy. And so I finally, I finish my meal and I throw away my trash. And I walk over and I tap him on the shoulder. And he recoils. I guess he thought he was getting in trouble. I said, excuse me. He said, yeah. And I said, what you're doing sure makes a difference. He said, no, I didn't. I, I, I... <laughs> what? I said, what you're doing sure makes a difference. Huh? I said, look at this place. It's jam-packed with people. They're, every one of them's generating trash. If you didn't clean these tables, in five minutes there'd be trash everywhere. It'd be unhealthy, unsanitary, an unpleasant place, and people wouldn't, wouldn't come in here. What you're doing matters. And I just thought I'd say thanks for doing it. See ya. And walked off. Well, I walked off. I got about 10 feet away, and then I turned and looked back. And I swear in the time it took me to travel 10 feet, he had grown six inches. <laughs> now, he didn't become service man and say, hey, good morning, welcome to the food court. Have I got a deal for you? Looks like you could use some fiber today. Come with me. You know, <laughs> nothing like that was going on. All that happened was he went from negative to neutral. But what do you bet? For the balance of his day, he treated people better. A little. What do you bet? For the balance of his day, he handled problems a tiny bit more smoothly and felt better about himself. Is that an accurate assessment, you think? Question, what did I do? What was it I had done that had that effect on him? The questions get too hard, let me know. <laughs> Just acknowledge him. Acknowledge him. Validated his worth. There you go, validated his worth. Very good way to put it. Is that what you were going to say? Very positive yes. Made him, Made him feel important. What I did was I pointed out the direct connection between his behavior, his performance, and the value other people got from it. I pointed out the connection between what he did and what others got from it. When you find more value in what you do, when you find more meaning in what you do, you bring more value to what you do. Let me restate that to make sure you got it the right way. Okay, When you find more meaning in what you do, you bring more value to what you do. And I think that is something within all of our grasp every day. I mean, that was a very simple, as a friend of mine calls, pedestrian example of something that could be done. But in a more meaningful way, how do you motivate your employees if you own an organization? Well, remember that the key to the word motivation or the concept of motivation is the word motive. Motive, a want to, a reason, a desire, a, a meaning in what you're doing. So if we add more meaning to things by pointing out the value of it to other people, then it not only gets them more motivated to do things, but it gets it affects us as well. Years ago, I, I had told that story to a speech coach, Ron Arden. Terry Paulson knows him. And um, Ron was a brilliant speaking coach and theater director. And I had spent several sessions with him at, at, in the uh, mid-2000s. And... Um, I came in for my next session, and I said, okay, Ron, I want to work on He said, wait a minute, before we go into what we're going to work on today, I've got to tell you a story. 
one of your stories came to life for me the other day. I said, really? One of my stories came to life? How? He said, well, I was in, I've forgotten what city he was in, let's say Chicago, and I had done my work for my client. I was at dinner alone that evening in a restaurant, and I noticed this couple across the room from me that were easily in their 90s, if not beyond 100. I mean, they, they had been here a while. And just the two of them dining together, and they seemed to be enjoying each other more than anybody else in the entire restaurant. I mean, they were holding hands. They were flirting with each other. They were just having a wonderful time. And so I thought on my way out, I, I'd do what you did in Atlanta. I, I'd go over and comment on it. And so I just stopped at the table and I said, excuse me, I don't mean to intrude, but I'd like to make an observation. Either you two are very young lovers or very dear friends or you have something special because even from across the room, I could tell how much fun you're having with each other tonight. And it's a delight to observe it. They were speechless. They just looked at him and said, what, what, what a wonderful thing to say. Thank you. Please join us. He said, no, I, thank you, but I've got to go. And he, he left the room. Now, he said, Jim, I knew that would make them feel better. What I didn't know is it would make me feel better. I still feel better today from what I did last week. So you and I, if we go out into the world looking to bring life, looking to bring joy, looking to, to point out, to notice more and to point out to other people the meaning, the value, the beauty. When we do that, when we bring that to the table each day, each place we go, the world becomes a better place for us. So do it selfishly if you want to. It's an unselfish act from the exterior. But on the inside, you could be doing it for totally selfish purposes. I want to feel good about me. Therefore, Harry, sorry, but I'm going to have to help you have a better day. So brace yourself. Here it comes. You know, right? So what, what we bring to the world matters a lot. And the nice thing is it's discretionary. We can choose each day to be more intentional about how we interact with others, how we face life's challenges, how we deal with goals and other situations that, that we encounter. And that's something else I wanted to focus on. The first, first point of my presentation today is meaning. Find more meaning in what you do. Point out the meaning to other people. So the more meaning you find, the more value everyone brings, okay, and feels. The second is intention. Be more intentional in your life. They say, if you want to know more, begin to notice more. The essence of intelligence is the ability to make distinctions. So if I were more intelligent about lighting, then I would notice more about the lighting in this room and the way it's structured and how many options are available and how many possibilities and what kind of lighting should be here when we're filming and what should be here if it was a regular meeting or a dinner or something. You know, so I would notice more about lighting than other people do. And therefore, I would be more intelligent about that subject. Same thing would be true if it was about flooring or about meeting structure or about uh, system design or interpersonal communications or whatever it happens to be. So whatever fascinates you, whatever you care about, my suggestion is notice more about it. When I go into a meeting as a professional speaker, I, I'm often, well, actually, as a professional speaker, what I do for a living is what mom said not to do. I talk to strangers. <laughs> Everywhere I go, I walk into that meeting room, and the vast majority of the people that are there are strangers to me. And by the end of the meeting, we're usually friends. So that's my goal. But I go into that meeting and I notice more from the parking lot even. When I pull in, I think about, okay, what's it like to come here, park, find your way to the meeting room? What are other people experiencing? How would they feel about that probably? What am I experiencing? And then I, I go to the meeting room. How easy was the room to find? How comfortable is the seating? Which direction are we facing? Does that work for the structure of the meeting? What about the lighting, the temperature? What about, you know, and I think about all of that. And then I, I always assume part ownership in the event. So even though I'm the outside guest, I'm the, the, you know, guy with a briefcase, 
who just showed up to bring some value. I assume I'm a part owner in this event. So I greet other people. I welcome them. I thank them for coming. I pick up trash if I see a piece of trash on the floor. I prop a door open if, if the door is likely to lock and keep people from being able to get into the room. You know, things like that. I, I rearrange chairs if necessary. I've found over 36 years of professional speaking by doing that, I've never once out of 2,700 engagements had an occasion where someone says, I really wish you hadn't done that. Or I really felt like you were taking license. You, you overstepped your bounds here. You were just much too nice and courteous and helpful. So please be more of a jerk next time you come. No. Just be more intentional about it. But then another thing is look at your life. This might be a good exercise for you later on. Sometime today when you've got a few minutes, just draw a circle and put a cross in the middle of it, you know, an X in the middle of it, and then draw a line straight up and down and a line straight side to side so that you create a pie with eight pieces. And consider each line on there. Forget the pieces and look at the lines between the pieces. And consider each of those lines to be a part of your life. So you've got the circle, one, two, three, four divisions of it. So that's eight lines from the center out to the sides. And each line represents part of your life. Mental, the first one, your mind, your intellect, your intelligence, mental capacity, okay? Physical, family, social, spiritual, career, whatever your career, you know, whatever that means for you, financial, and emotional, mental, physical, family, social, spiritual, career, financial, emotional. And think of it as a rating scale from zero at the center to 10 at the outside. And then look at each aspect of that wheel. I call it a priority wheel. And you look at your life that way and you say, okay, this part of my life, how fully am I living this part of my life now? Not how much have I accomplished in the past or where am I going or how much money do I have or anything. How fully am I living in a mental, intellectual uh, way right now? And give yourself a ranking zero to ten. Put a little dot on the line. So let's say you give yourself a three. You're just not really reflecting on things often enough. You're not stopping to think about it. You're just going on with life. Well, obviously, there's a need right there for, or an opportunity for you to live more fully from a mental perspective. And you could start reading other things, associating with other people that are fascinating, getting into some discussion groups, start subscribing to an email feed that brings you information on a particular topic that you like, whatever, but exercising your mind. And then you look at physical, same thing. Not just what kind of physical shape am I in, because that's your current reality like your age. That's the starting point. What counts now is how fully are you living based on that reality? Am I using the mental or physical capacities that I have? What could I do to increase that? I could go for a walk, but, ah, oh, man, it hurts when I walk. Well, walk for four and a quarter minutes. If the fifth minute hurts, that's when you sit down. But walk for four and a quarter minutes three days in a row, next thing you know, you're doing seven minutes or 20 or a half an hour. Or you're going for a hike or you're running or whatever. The parts of our body we use get the message from our brain, hey, I'm still online. Gee, I'm still employed. I'm needed. Maybe not today, but I'm needed. So I guess I better stay vital. The parts of our body we decide to neglect. Now, I know it's kind of uncomfortable when I do that, so I'm not going to do that. They get the message, you're off duty. You can go ahead and fade now, you know, and the atrophy begins. So keep every part of your physical body vital. Keep every part of your mind vital socially interacting with other people, spiritually, you know, your faith and your practice of whatever your belief system happens to be. Financial, it's not how much money you have, but what do you do with the money that comes and goes through your life? Are you aware of it? Be more intentional. Notice more about it. Just think about every aspect of your life that way. And then when it comes to emotional, if you are not expressing a wide range of emotions, the chances are good there's a big portion of living that's available to you that's not being used. 
And when I say that, I mean emotions like crying and emotions like laughing, a belly laugh that hurts when you do it, and emotions like celebrating, you know, just joyful celebration of something. Emotions like nurturing and bonding and, and compassion and feeling that connection with someone else. You know, every emotion is noble in its place. Even anger has a place. And I think we ought to learn to know when that emotion is appropriate and handle that emotion in the way that makes things best for us and the rest of the world connected to us. Everything's got its place, a place for everything, okay? So be more intentional. Years ago, I was in Chicago. I was hired by an outfit called Tidy Car. A man named Gary Gorenson had called me. He said, we need you to come and speak to our uh, training seminar for Tidy Car. We're teaching people how to build a practice or a business uh, as an auto detailing specialist. I said, car wash. He said, well, yeah, but uh, a notch up from that. <laughs> I said, okay. So I went to Chicago in January. Let that sink in. Whew. In 1979, that was a very severe January in Chicago. But I was there speaking to a group. I don't remember the size of the group, maybe 50 or 100 people. And all of them had recently bought a franchise to have an auto detailing company under the banner Tidy Car. And they were doing these all over the country because it was really catching on and franchising was huge at that time. Century 21 had just changed real estate by introducing franchising to that. McDonald's had done that in fast food and so forth. So I was speaking to the Tidy Car group, and there's a 19-year-old kid sitting in the front row. And I mean, he's soaking up every word that's being said. He's taking notes like crazy. His eyes are you know, as big as saucers. And he's listening intently to everything that's being said. And so as I'm speaking, I keep looking at him because, man, he's just pulling the information out of me with his eyes. And uh, finally, at the end of my speech, he came up and he said, excuse me, can I speak with you? I said, well, sure. He said, I'm Tim Seward from Bay City, Michigan, and I just bought a new Tidy Car franchise, and I'm 19 year years old, and, and I don't know much about this, but I really liked your ideas. Can I sit with you at lunch? Phew, okay chill, you know, calm down a little bit. So we sat together at lunch and we talked and he asked me a thousand questions and it was delightful. And at the end of lunch, he said, could I ask you one last question? And I said, okay, one last question. What? He said, do you have a quote? I said, excuse me? He said, you know, a, a slogan, a motto, a quote, something I could use to motivate myself every day. I said, well, I hadn't thought about that. I said, I've got a better thing. I've got a question. He said, all right, what's the question? I said, now, every day I'd like you to ask yourself this question as often as you can remember to do it. He said, okay, what's the question? How would the person I'd like to be do the things I'm about to do? He said, so I think of someone I'd like to be. I said, no, no. You think of the best possible version of you. That's the person you want to aspire to be. You don't want to aspire to be me or someone else. You want to aspire to be you, best possible version. And ask yourself every day, often, how would the person I'd like to be, the future me, how would that version of me do today's activities? Everything you do will be upgraded. He said, I like that. I like that. So Tim Seward went back home to Bay City. I went home. And in the meantime... Tim started applying this every day. He took that, that quote, that question, and put it over his workbench in the garage because he didn't have a business location. He was mobile. And uh, he put it over the visor in his car so that every day he would see the question. And he said, okay, I would like to be the international sales leader for Tidy Car. And Tidy Car has hundreds, if not thousands, of franchisees now around the world. So I want to be the international sales leader for this group. How would the international sales leader organize his work? And so he got his files, which were just basically a bunch of paper stuffed in a big box in his garage, and put it into an accordion file, which was a very primitive but useful version of a filing system. And so he started organizing better. He said, how would the international sales leader dress? And he got rid of the T-shirt and jeans, and he got a pair of coveralls or a set of coveralls that said Tim on the pocket and a big Tidy Car logo on the back. And he wore it everywhere he could because it helped advertise his business. 
how would the international sales leader treat his customers? And so he started overdoing each assignment. So he'd get a $50 polishing job for a car and do a $70 polishing job. Well, his customers were so happy they referred him to more business, and he got overwhelmed, and he had to hire other people. And then he got overwhelmed again, and he had to lease a permanent location, a service station, that he could use as the tidy car store. And his business grew. So fast forward even more to the end of the year. I get a call from Tidy Car. Gary says, Jim, you did a great job in Chicago. We want you to be the keynote speaker at our International Sales Award Banquet in New Orleans. Can you come? Yes. So I went to New Orleans, went into the Hilton Hotel down in the French Quarter, and down the hallway at the end, there's a big meeting room that had the movable walls. You've seen those, you know, the, the ceiling seven million feet high, and, and they fold the walls up. So we're in the last one of those rooms, and there's a big stage that's about, I don't know, four feet off the ground, and a ramp leading up to it. And on the stage is a white Corvette a brand new Chevrolet Corvette that's going to be given to the international sales leader. And all the people are seated at round tables and it's elegant with steak and lobster and candles and all this kind of thing, which really was thrilling to see. And I did my speech and I turned the microphone back over to the president of the company and he said, ladies and gentlemen, never in my life have I given away a car. And I can't wait to do this. I've got to share something with you. You all know what the competition was this year, and you know you saw month to month who was a leader and who was, you know, who was in the running, and you, you don't know who the finalists are, but you certainly know who's in the running. Well, let me tell you about the contest. The person who finished in position number two led number three by one point. Three led four by one point. Four led five by two. Five led six by one. It was a close, very close competition except for first place. The person who won this contest and will drive that Corvette home led number two by 300 points. There was no competition for first place. It was a runaway. Welcome with me, your international sales leader from Bay City, Bay City Michigan. Absolutely. Tim Seward, the place went insane. People jumped to their feet. They screamed. They cheered. Everybody's dancing around. They picked up Tim on their shoulders. People started hugging each other. A few people took advantage of that. It was fun. <laughs> so they get Tim to the front of the room. He's up there by the Corvette, and I make my way through the crowd and give him a bear hug of congratulations. And I say, Tim, I'm so proud of you. He said, oh, wait till you hear what happened. And I said, well, what? I just heard Gary tell the story. He said, oh, no, you don't know the backstory." Then he told me all the things I just shared with you about what he had done back in Bay City and how he had become more intentional about every single act in his day. He said, I was getting ready to come to New Orleans. I knew I had a shot, but I didn't know if I'd won because they weren't releasing those numbers. So I asked myself, how would the international sales leader <laughs> go to New Orleans? He said, Jim, I figured he'd go first class one way. <laughs> no. I said, you didn't. He said, yes. I said, you bought a first class one way ticket to New Orleans and, and didn't know you'd won. He said, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I said, you know, didn't that seem just a little foolhardy? He said, Jim, you think I'll need a ride? <laughs> no, I guess not. And good for Tim, huh? I mean, here's a guy who just absolutely applied that concept of how would the person I'd like to be do the thing I'm about to do every single day, and, and it paid off for him in spades. Absolutely. You had a comment or a question? One year. Did, it took him one year to do that? It took him one year to do that. In his first year in business, the guy was amazing, still is amazing to this day. I mean, he was born in 1960, so you can do the math, figure out how old he is today. Today he owns a software company in North Carolina that's a licensee of Microsoft. So the boy's doing pretty darn well. But, I mean, what a beautiful example of taking a simple concept, a question, and transforming your own life. You know, people say to me, oh, you changed his life. No, I didn't. He changed his life. All I did was present a question he could use, right? I can't change anyone's life except my own. And even that one, I can only change the direction of it, you know, the quality of it. I can't change the essence of it itself. So think about your life and think about all those different areas, mental, physical, family, social, spiritual, career, financial, and emotional, 
and become more intentional about every single part of it. Years ago, I took a motorcycle trip. My wife, Paula, and I, 25th anniversary. We celebrated it on a, well, she celebrated with a diamond ring, but I celebrated it with her on the back seat of a motorcycle as we toured the Alps, 3,000 miles through the Swiss and Italian and Austrian and German and French Alps. Wow. And we got to Zermatt, Switzerland, and we were on top of, not on top, but uh, at, at the lower peak, Kleine Matterhorn, Little Matterhorn. We were there, and we went out from the gondola that lifts the skiers up there and went up on top of the building, and there's a, a huge crucifix up there, life-size crucifix, very overpowering experience to see that. And under it, there's an inscription in like five different languages. But the English says, be more human. Wow. That's an inspiring, uh, thought-provoking statement. And I, I treasure that moment that I saw that because in that setting, you can imagine how overpowering that is. Be more human. What does that mean? You know, not more animal, more human. Because animals, the general category, and within that category, the, the ones that appear to be most enlightened are the humans. So what does it mean to be human? I think it means to be intentional. It means to be caring. It means to be meaningful. It means to be a producer of abundance. In other words, that we take on the responsibility to make things better than we found them. So if you think about key points in what I'm talking about, meaning and purpose, that's the first point, okay? Notice more. Find the meaning. Point it out and talk about it with other people. Be more intentional about every part of your life. The next one is relationships. Think about the fact that your life experience is basically a, a chain of interactions with other people. Does that make sense to you? That your life experiences is interacting with other people in various ways over a period of many, many years. Great. Okay. You know the old statement, it's not what you know that counts, it's who you know. I dispute that one. Because it's not who you know that counts, it's the way you know. The way, that's good, the way you know them. Another statement is, well, you know, it's who they know. Or it's who knows you. Or it's, you know, and they come up with lots of extrapolations of this. I've, I've posed that question to a lot of audiences around the world. I believe it's not what you know that counts the most. It's not who you know that counts the most. It's not who knows you that counts the most. It's not who they know that counts the most. What counts the most is who's glad they know you. Let that one sink in. Who is glad that they know you? Because if someone's not glad they know you, you don't have a relationship. You may have a transaction, but you don't have a relationship. You know, you can have a transaction with a vending machine, but you don't bond. <laughs> okay? Only with a person is there going to be any sense of, of lasting connection there. All right? So think about your relationships and be more intentional. Think about, well, here's one thing I do. When I'm working with an executive team, I'll sit them down. If I'm consulting with a business, I'll sit the executive team down, and I'll have each one of them identify their inner circle. That's the connections directly around them that they get all their results through. So if I were uh, one of the leaders in the Council on Aging here, then this would, the, the people behind the dais here would be primary members of my inner circle in that role. Now, in my life, I'd have other players in, in my inner circle, but in this context, that would be the beginning point of my inner circle. So the quality of this organization's life experience, the quality of its output, its impact on the community and so forth, is directly related to the quality of the connections between each person in that inner circle. If there's dysfunction in the inner circle, there's going to be dysfunction in the organization. If you say, no, 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 this is, let's say, Disneyland, happiest place on earth. It doesn't matter if our people don't get along with each other, they treat the customers well. Ah, if they don't get along with each other, they're not treating the customers as well as you think they are, right? How many of you have, uh, have been the fortunate recipient of next when someone who's going to serve you just had a fight with their colleague? 
Yeah, me too. Don't you? You just gonna, no. Let her go first. You know. No. <laughs> I, that's the thing. When 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 you put a person in a public contact position, one of the things that's important to recognize is everyone has a tolerance level for human contact. Some people they can be with a million people a day and they hadn't reached tolerance level yet. Other people, two interactions. It's done, right? So let's say somebody's tolerance level is 216 people and you're the next person trying to get your boarding pass from that person. You see what I mean? You've been there, right? We've all been there. When somebody's day turned from, I'm enduring this, to, okay, who's next? You're my victim, right? So we all have that. And if we, if we notice more about ourselves, we'll notice when we're kind of reaching our limit in in. I don't know, being reasonable or level-headed or non-emotional or whatever it happens to be. The more self-aware you are, the more intentional you can be and the more helpful you can be to the rest of the world. So look at your relationships and then ask yourself, how many of these relationships need a little homework? Because the three essentials for a relationship to be healthy. This comes from the work of doctors David and Vera Mace the Association of Couples for Marriage in Richmond many, many years ago. Three essentials for a healthy relationship, whether it's a business relationship, personal, whatever. Number one, both parties must be committed to the success of the relationship. Because if, if they're standing at the altar, for example, and one of them says, oh, I do, until death do us part and with body, mind, and soul, and come wind and snow and dark of night, yeah, I'm in. All in. There. That, you bet. You bet. And the other one says, yeah, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. So there's got to be mutual commitment to the success of the relationship. Right? One person can only keep one half of the relationship functional. All right. The second essential for a healthy relationship, open communication. Now, what I mean by that is the truth is always okay. It's always preferred. Even when it's ugly news, it's always preferred to a veiled version of the truth. Okay? So if the communication is open, that means if you and I have some kind of a challenge to deal with, we will deal with it as opposed to ignore it or just tolerate it. And if we get in the habit of doing that, the earlier we do that, the more productive our relationship is over time anyway. And then we never dread the next interaction. Okay? Third essential for a healthy relationship, clear agreements. We know what we've agreed to. You know, if in this relationship, let's say it's a financial relationship, and I've agreed to do the, the record keeping and, and the documentation and manage the system, and you've agreed to, to do most of the revenue production. Okay, fine. As long as we're clear on that agreement, then you can't fault me for not bringing in new business because I didn't agree to that. And I can't fault you for not managing the system efficiently because you didn't sign up for that. So whatever it is in your relationship, whether it's who's going to do the garbage and who's going to do the cooking and whatever, or whether it's something more profound than that, look at each relationship and ask yourself, are we both committed to the success of it? If not, we've got to do some surgery and get this thing back on track. Second. Is the communication open? Do we really tell each other the truth soon enough that it doesn't become a big problem? And third, do we have a clear understanding of what to expect from each other? Because if we have clear expectations, we can resolve conflict. If we don't have clear expectations, we fill that void with guilt, blame, accusation, sarcasm, avoidance, all the things that destroy a relationship. Okay? And you say, I don't, I don't want to, no, that's too much work and it hurts. I don't want to look at my relationships that hard. Hey, the pain's going to be there anyway. You either deal with it or you just endure it. Now. You know, yeah, now or later. You want to pay me now or you want to pay me later? You can pay me, I, I'll take my pay in ulcers. How's that? Okay, tension and its related problems. I'll take it my pay in that. Or we can deal with it now and then there you go. So I think you see the point. Relationships are assets. And our life is a series of relationships. And if we can take each relationship and eliminate the dysfunctional areas and get them thriving again, then all of a sudden we get up in the morning looking forward to seeing everybody. 
And then the third part of relationships is asking yourself, how can I make that person glad he or she knows me today? What can I do today to make that person happier about the fact that they're connected with me? And I think the first thing we could do, the easiest thing of all, is gratitude and praise. Acknowledge whatever they're doing right. Acknowledge whatever you can find to like or admire. Tell them what you respect about them or about something they've done or about you know, something that pleases you or makes the world a better place because they're in it. Say it. Don't just think it. Say it. Because if you don't say it, it's not known. Okay? And then express your gratitude. And you say, oh, I do express my gratitude. They just don't get it. Their problem. No, no, I would say that that's still your problem. If I thank you 11 times for something and you don't feel thanked, am I done? Probably not. No, because the purpose of gratitude is not to have token thanked someone and checked it off your list. You know, I sent them a thank you, you know, what do you want? Well, real gratitude would be a start, <laughs> but... It's not about thanking people. It's about causing them to feel thanked, causing them to experience your gratitude. And if we do that, then people get up in the morning and I wonder what excuse I could make to see her today because she always makes me feel so good whenever I'm around her, right? So as we back off and look at our lives a little more objectively and we start seeing these opportunities, we will find abundant opportunities to make our world a better place, make ourselves feel better, and make other people feel better. Someone said, well, I, you know, I'm just not motivated to do that. I'm not motivated at all. Really? Yeah. And, and employers tell me, yeah, I got some people that aren't motivated. What, what can I do to motivate them? Well, first off, let's get something clear. Everybody is motivated. Every person on earth is motivated. Everyone has a motive of some sort, multiple motives, okay? It's just that some of those are dysfunctional motives, right? Okay? So how do you motivate someone? Well, think of the word motivate as two words, motive and action. Motive, action, motive, eight, okay? So you don't bring motives to people. You find motives in people. So everyone's motivated. Well, so and so's not motivated. They don't even get off the couch. They just sit there. They're motivated to avoid interaction. They're motivated to avoid pain or discomfort. And that leads into a depression cycle. You know, the, 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 there's the whole clinical lineup of how to deal with that. But everyone's got a motive. If we can just make it enjoyable to be with us or around us. Make it safe, emotionally and physically, to be around us, right? And I, I said emotionally first for a reason. If it's not emotionally safe around you, then people will avoid you. How can you make it more emotionally safe? Be a good finder. Everywhere you go, every person you meet, look for something to admire. Look for something to respect. Look for something to like. And then make sure you comment on it somehow. Don't make a big deal of it. Just point it out. Just say, I noticed you know, you helping that gentleman down the hallway a while ago. That was very nice of you. Thank you. And then just go on. Don't, make a, don't wait for feedback. Just go on your way, like I did with that guy in the airport in Atlanta. You know, what you're doing sure makes a difference. I just thought I'd say thanks for doing it, and I walked away. Now, if I'd stayed there, it would have changed the interaction entirely. So I just walked away and then glanced back, and I noticed he was standing taller and seemed to be feeling better. Okay. You know, so few people in this world regularly get that kind of appreciation that if you and I, just the people in this room and watching this broadcast, if we can be the starting point for just one little wave of that, we can make a profound difference in the world because it is truly contagious. Have you seen the TV ads where they have one person helping someone and then another helps and another helps and, and it's just a, kind of a random thing? Someone observes it and they say, well, what a nice thing. Oh, well, I could do that, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, I, I think what we need to do is we need to encourage more interaction of a positive nature by being the example. 
I mean, when I, I, I'm part of a local group called the Heartbreak Hiking Fools, and we pretty much live up to that reputation, okay? And uh, it's a group of about 40 of us. It's not really a membership group, but just a group of friends that get together, and we even have our own logo wear. And we go out hiking on all the local mountains here in the Santa Monicas. And we show up every Sunday and every Wednesday and most Fridays, and we go hike some rugged trek for three miles and go on a timer watch and two hiking poles, kind of a competitive thing to see if you can beat your own personal best time. And at the end of it, we all meet for coffee and just enjoy each other's company for a little while, and then we go home. And it's a great way to stay fit, and we've got members from 80 years old to 40 years old in the group, and it, it's quite a fascinating mix of, of cultures and subcultures when we all gather for coffee. And when we gather for coffee, when we, there's a, a little restaurant that we kind of take over its unused space early in the morning because the restaurant opens later in the day. And when we go up to that space, the first thing we start doing is picking up the trash and, and straightening the place from what it was the night before. People say, well, you don't have to do that. It's not even your place. Yeah, but it's nicer if, if you do that. Yeah, but you don't get anything. Yes, I do. I get satisfaction, and I get a nicer place to be. And that restaurant doesn't resent my presence. Kind of a big payoff, too, right? Otherwise, I'd have a sign, you know, heartbreak hikers, go home. Um, but, you know, we have a great time, and, and we all have cultivated that uh, kind of little attitude. If we're on a trail and someone else laid some trash down, we'll carry it back with us. wasn't our trash, but we'll carry it back. So... Yesterday, I was doing a seminar for the Ventura County Community Foundation over in uh, Camarillo, and my topic was public speaking and running meetings. How do, you, how do you lead meetings in such a way that it advances your cause? And one of the things I was talking about is when you go to meetings, what, how, what can you do? How can you take this spirit I've been talking about and bring it into your business world or your community service world? Here's a suggestion. Be the person in your organization who always brings joy to the meeting, even the heavy, serious meetings. Bring a joyful spirit, even if, you, if you're not laughing and joking. Well, what does that mean? It means when you show up, even if you show up late, don't do the sneaky thing where you're trying to close the door so quietly no one can hear it, but everybody's watching you do it, right? You know? They see you, for heaven's sake, so just come in, be courteous about how quietly you close it, but not, not scientific, and then look at the group and say, you know, sorry I'm late, little, just kind of verbalize, not verbalize, but, but mouth the words, and then just take your seat, and don't say, excuse me, excuse me, and then hunch over and sneak in front of the group. You can't sneak in front of a group, okay? <laughs> so if you show up late, just smile at the group, hey, and then sit down and participate in the meeting. If you show up early, be the person greeting the other people. Yeah, but I'm not in charge of the meeting. Who cares? You're part owner. You're there. So start greeting other people and welcoming them, thanking them for coming. Point out how nice they look. You know, something. Ask a question that shows you care. <laughs> I was The other day I ran into, the other day being months ago, I, I ran into a situation with a service rep on the phone, and he was giving me such a hard time. You should have done so-and-so, which was impossible at that point because that time had passed. I said, well, I understand, and I didn't do that, and, I, you know, I'm sorry I didn't do that, so what can we do now? Well, you should have done so-and-so. And he's a broken record. Kept coming back to you should have, you should have, you should have. I said, well, yeah, I said, obviously, this is frustrating for you because it certainly is for me as well. He said, well, you know, which means yes. And uh, I said, why don't you, why don't you just transfer me to someone who cares? <laughs> big silence big silence well uh, I care I said no I mean about me and about helping me resolve the situation no I care really I'm sorry I couldn't tell from the way we were interacting he said well yeah it's just that you should I said well I know I should have <laughs> and I, I really do apologize for not having done that so what can I do now? He said, well, and all of a sudden we're partners in problem solving. Whoa! I mean, there was a miracle took place. Something transformed this guy 
from my adversary, my warden, you know, my my school teacher, my whatever, you know, somebody that was scolding me for misbehaving, to someone who's my partner in problem solving. Wow. And it was just the change in the energy of that relationship. So when we come into a situation, if we take initiative to be the bright spot in the day, to be the person that helps arrange the chairs or, or do whatever to make things work better, be the person that if there's a loud noise, we take initiative. If the meeting planner's not going to do it, we take initiative to go address the loud noise or whatever it happens to be. Take ownership in your part in that event, and other people will want you there. In other words, they'll be glad they know you. And when you get other people to where they're glad they know you, then motivation is going to be a very easy thing because then people will share their motives. There's an old line. We, Terry Paulson and I talk about this from time to time. In, among professional speakers, it's epic that you will run across this sooner or later. I was on a plane years ago, sat down in the first row of first class. guy next to me said, so what do you do? I said, well, good morning to you. He said, so what do you do? Obviously wasn't going to do the other greetings. You know, they just wanted to get to the point. I said, I am a motivational speaker. He said, really, you don't look like a motivational speaker. <laughs> I said, well, it's my day off. <laughs> no, actually, I stole that line. I stole that from Joe Griffith from Texas. Hilarious. Anyway, he said, he said, I don't believe in motivation. Clearly trying to bond with me. So I said, really, you don't believe in motivation. Why? And then the flight attendant standing right beside us. We haven't taken off yet. And uh, she, she's eavesdropping. He said, motivation's no good because it doesn't last. And she had just been to a Zig Ziglar seminar two days before. Zig's a good friend. And uh, she quoted Zig. She says, well, according to Zig Ziglar, neither does a bath, but it's still a good idea now and then. <laughs> So the fact that motivation doesn't last is insignificant. You know, think about it. People say, well, you know, this motivational stuff, question every day and be more intentional and goal setting and all this stuff. You know, that's just, that's a bunch of malarkey. I don't, I don't need to do that. Really. Why? Because it doesn't last. Do you eat? Well, of course I eat. Why? It doesn't last. Well, it, that's physical. Ah, well, do you tell your spouse that you love him or her? Yeah. I mean, you didn't just tell them at the wedding and you're done? No. Well, why would you want to say it again? I mean, they already know. Well, and they get it, you know, after you explore it a little bit. Everything in life's temporary. Everything. So how can you make a difference? That's easy. Make sure your imprint is always a positive imprint. Always be the person advancing life through whatever it is you're doing. Bring happiness to the room. Bring initiative to the situation. Bring compliments and, and pointing out the meaning in things so that other people add more value to it because they can see why it matters. And, and they can feel a sense of self-worth. And just make sure that when it comes to, like in my case, the baby boom, you reignite the boom. And let me wrap up with a little tune I wrote, a little parody. It kind of picks up on that theme. I think that the baby boom and the economic boom both should be reignited. Because the baby boom could easily, since we're all aging now, become the baby fade. Although it's not as phonetically appealing. But I think what we ought to do instead is we ought to reboom. Resume the boom. I swear I'll never grow old again. Resume the boom. I'll rock and roll to the very end. Resume the boom. I still have a dream, sweetheart. Restart. Resume the boom. I still have a dream. While those without one are in paradise up above. Goal achievement is a thing I really love. I still have a dream, sweetheart. Restart. I swear I'll never grow old again. Resume the boom. I'll rock and roll to the very end. Resume the boom. I still have a dream, sweetheart. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Council. I appreciate it. Are you in a position to take questions if there are any from the audience? And are there? And if so, if you would please go up uh, uh, just so the television can hear you. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, <laughs> we got lots of hiding places. This projection program, right? It's you, right here. You know, I was curious. You were marvelous. Thank you. If you had my looks with your ability, you'd be unbeatable. I'd be unstoppable. But I was. I, Jim, I'm Daryl Mix Glad nice to, meet to meet you. I was wondering, how does one become a motivational speaker? Gift of gas. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> gift of gas. Yeah, you got to kiss the Blarney Stone. Thank you. Um, the reason I'm pausing is I'm trying to think of a short answer to that because the, it's long and wide. For me, years ago, Little Rock, Arkansas, 1972, and uh, I've had that question before, so that's why I'm so clear on, on the answer to this. Um, I was working as a clerk, government clerk, for the Housing Authority, the Urban Renewal Agency in Little Rock, Arkansas. I was in my 20s. I had never been a star student. I'd never been a, an athlete. I'd never been successful in any particular venture in a big way. I was always part of the group and fit in well, but I never stood out. So I didn't expect a big, meaningful life. I expected to just grow up to be like a middle manager at the phone company because Dad worked at the phone company as a repairman. I figured that would be good. And I thought my life would be kind of unre unremarkable. And uh, I was newly married, had a new baby at home. I was 50 pounds overweight, out of shape, never exercised much, smoked two packs a day. And I was sitting there. Now, I was an assistant to the loan specialist, and the loan specialist wasn't busy. <laughs> His name was Bob Moore, and Bob Moore had lots of free time. So I had eight hours a day of free time. <laughs> And I was bored to tears. I was reading urban renewal books, pretty clear that wasn't the future path I wanted. And uh, I heard the radio playing in the next room. It was Earl Nightingale on the radio. Remember Earl Nightingale? The Dean of Personal Motivation. And that day, his little five-minute message said, if you will spend one hour extra each day studying your chosen field, in five years or less, you'll be a national expert in that field. That hit me like a train. I couldn't believe it. Wow. That, I, that actually would work. I, even I could put in an extra hour. Heck, I'm a government clerk. I got eight hours a day. I could probably do this by Thursday. You know, so, wow. What do I want to be an expert at? Well, it sure wasn't urban renewal. So the more I thought about it, I said, I want to do what the guy on the radio is doing. I want to help people grow. I had two problems. I'd never given a speech. And I had nothing to say. That will keep your fees modest. So I started thinking, what do I, you know, how do I become an expert in the field of personal development when I don't have a clue about any of it? Well, I need to start studying human behavior and psychology, and I need to start studying business and, you know, the interpersonal communication and all the basic, what are typically known as soft skills that make people more effective in living any kind of a life. So I became fanatical, and I mean that in the literal textbook sense of fanatical. Two, three hours a day, entire weekends, I would spend just studying personal development, reading books, listening to records. That's like a CD, large thing, little hole in the middle. And um, has sound. And um, I would go to seminars, and there weren't many seminars back then. This was the beginning of what became known as the human potential movement. And so I got involved in it in a fanatical way, and, of course, my circle of friends changed because the first friends were saying, oh, Lord, here he comes again, right? And the other friends were saying, no kidding? Really? What would you read? Well, do you have a cup? Can I see? You know, and they're into it, too. So my, my social world evolved to people that were more proactive, kept a few of the former friends. And um, my life started expanding. I started getting new job opportunities. And a couple of years later, I was a full-time trainer leading seminars other people had structured. And then I started doing my own research, and then I bought a psychological research firm years later and became a full-time professional speaker, and now I've done 27 engagements all over the world. I've been inducted into the Speaker Hall of Fame. Like Terry Paulson, I've been the, uh, the president of the National Speakers Association. 
I received from Toastmasters International their Golden Gavel Award, which had previously gone to, you ready, Earl Nightingale, <laughs> my hero. And uh, so that's how one becomes a motivational speaker. Thank you for the question. You bet. You bet. Thank you, sir. It's a joy being here. Thank you. Again. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. All right, we're going to now move on to agenda item six, our community reports. And uh, our first report will be on the SAMP team. Nick, could you uh, introduce our next speaker, please? Yes, thank you, Jim. Um, our Senior Adult Master Plan Implementation Committee functions through um, five different uh, teams, and we have the leaders of two of those teams with us today to uh, um, uh, present some updates on their team activities. And uh, so first here to show you how we implement Jim's remarks and so forth is Susan Bashar. Thank you. You know, I sure wish I wasn't following Jim. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> In January of last year, the first of 76 million baby boomers turned 65 years of age. Over the next 19 years, our facilities, programs, and services will be flooded as boomers mature into retirement. These statements are at the core of the mission of the recreation team. Our goal is not only to plan for the wave of baby boomers, but it is to preserve and enhance the recreational programming of our current senior population. Last month, the Board of Directors of the Caneo Recreation and Park District approved a name change and a tagline recommendation from this team. I was asked to summarize today the journey that led us to this point. Our team was formed in September of 2009 and began meeting in October. One of our action steps was labeled RE13 and directed our team to support the removal of barriers to avoid age group isolation. One of the ideas of our team was to rename the Goebbels Senior Adult Center into something more appealing for the future active senior population. We spent months researching data and surveys on the internet and in senior marketing publications. What we learned was that the word senior was a major barrier to the boomer population. Boomers see, see themselves as the ageless generation. So they reject any reference to aging. Most of the activities and programs currently in place for seniors will not attract the future more active adults. Our team determined that a gradual transition needed to take place for the older senior and the baby boomer. When our team decided to recommend renaming the Global Center, we had no idea how long the process would take. Maybe a few months, we thought. We, somebody's laughing. <laughs> um, we also had no idea of the process, which you will find out shortly. So our first action was to send a letter rec recommending a name change to the chairman of the Senior Adult Master Plan Implementation Committee. That was December of 2009. In January of 2010, <clears throat> we learned that we needed a bit more substance. Um, to our letter, such as research data uh, supporting our recommendation, uh, perhaps a feasibility study, a financial plan, um, and maybe actual names for people to consider to change the name, right? So over the next few months, our team researched and developed not only names for the center, but taglines to use in marketing. After learning that the CRPD, which is Caneo Recreation and Park District, um, after learning that they had talked about a name change in the past, our team felt energized to move forward in a timely manner. From May through September, there were a lot of individual and combined meetings by the city, CRPD, and the Council on Aging to discuss the correct procedures and protocol for our proposal. During this time, our team also created procedures to conduct a fair and an unbiased survey. Our procedures were sent to the city and approved in October of 2010. Concurrently, we compiled and edited numerous suggestions for a name change and taglines. Two months later, 
The Council on Aging approved a letter to be sent to CRPD asking for permission to proceed with the survey. And we were granted permission the following month. That was quick. The ballot consisted of four name change selections and one no change selection. The same choices were given for taglines. Eight groups were surveyed between February and April. In May of 2011, the Council on Aging voted to support the survey's recommendation of Goebel Adult Community Center and as the, as the proposed name change with a tagline of Connect, Enrich, Invigorate. A letter addressed to the CRPD recommending these proposals <coughs> was signed and sent to the city staff for processing. Okay, we thought, that can't take too long. But again, we were taught patience. Throughout last summer, this letter was discussed by various levels of staff within the city government and also CRPD, just to make sure that it was procedurally correct. Finally, it was determined that our letter would be included in the Senior Adult Master Plan annual report to the city. So in October of 2011, the City Council approved the report and therefore our letter to CRPD. At this point, we thought our project had ended. Letter approved, letter sent, right? Ah, but we were wrong. <laughs> Last December, we were advised to send a letter to CRPD asking if they wished to proceed with the name change. So another letter was drafted and approved by the Council on Aging, asking for consideration by CRPD's Board of Directors. Finally, last month on April 19th, two years and four months after the birth of this idea, the Board of Directors of the Caneo Recreation and Park District unanimously approved the name change and tagline recommendation. This change may seem directed at baby boomers, but the goal of the Senior Adult Master Plan is to make innovative changes based on the needs of the older senior population as well. The Global Center has a vast array of activities and programs for seniors, but so few people know what's there. So it is our goal to help to change that. Since the Global Center is overcrowded, our team is developing partnerships with local businesses and schools to provide more programming choices, <clears throat> excuse me, such as evening and weekend classes for boomers that are still working. Our struggling economy may pose challenges to our mission, but we are committed to providing a smooth demographic transition for all mature adults. We feel that this is a cornerstone of a healthy, senior-friendly community. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And next, representing our housing committee, we have Elise Klusman. I have nothing so earth-shaking to report, although the timing is essentially the same. Um, I'm Elise Klusman, chairman of the housing uh, SAMP committee. Our team has now embarked upon a process of evaluating our accomplishments since 2009 and what our goals should be for the future. We're studying various housing uh, solutions that have been implemented across the state and across the country. And we're looking to find those which uh, represent a diversity of choices for seniors, as well as solutions that are compatible with the budget and the master plan of the city of Thousand Oaks. Uh, currently updating our inventory of uh, single story homes, which we began a year and a half ago. But right now we're concentrating on apartments. We're trying to find which apartment complexes are suitable for seniors. We um, are also looking at the um, inventory of aging in place options. And I was interested to hear that Betty Berry is going to have a, a, a seminar on that on the, on the 9th. So we'll be involved in that and working with her. There are also um, options that we're looking at in terms of home sharing. And as many of you know, we have a, a box at the Global Center and um, we start, <clears throat> our tagline was, are you tired of living alone? And uh, we had some cards for people to fill out. We've been pretty successful in that. We're now collaborating with an organization in Ventura called 
Home Share Ventura. They are an, uh, a program of the Ventura County Area Agency on Aging, and they do all of the background checks. In fact, they have a grant in order to do that, so we're cooperating with them in that regard. In addition, we are polling both seniors and boomers uh, at community events and activities to gain a better perspective of their housing choices, and I have a copy of each of these. You have seen these. Um, we distributed them at the Village to Village program a couple of months ago and re received about uh, close to 100 responses, and we're continuing to do that, but we're looking to get access and, if necessary, permission to do this at such events as Conejo Valley Days and the Relay for Life. We're looking to get a, a personal approach to what seniors and boomers have as preferences for housing. If we don't continue to question the people that are going to be affected by housing, we're not going to know what solutions to offer the city. And so this is one more way that we're trying to find some additional information. Now, our most important activity right now is uh, an evaluation of our original goals. Um, we've decided that many of them were inappropriate for the times we live in. Given that the economic times are very tight for everybody, but particularly because of the, the uh, rescinding of the redevelopment funds for affordable housing. We have an, another way to look at how we're going to provide housing. So what we're doing is um, collecting, using the data that we've already collected and that that we're getting now, and try to put together a new set of goals that more accurately reflect what we what's within our purview to do, as well as what is realistic in terms of planning and, and budget and the economics of, of, the, uh, of the current times. Uh, we are hoping to have a complete inventory and some data to provide um, to, the, to the council by the end of June, and we'd like to have our housing inventory completed to put into the planned resource center at the Oaks Mall if that gets off the ground. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Elise. All right, we'll move on to uh, agenda item 6B, safety and preparedness. Commissioner Loomis. It is really tough to follow a gifted guest speaker and two gifted women. Uh, and uh, parenthetically, any of the females who are in view of this broadcast are here today on behalf of the entire council, I invite you to think about volunteering to help us with the work that we have to do for the city. As I was getting ready for today, it was a whole lot hotter last week than it is now. I have actually, uh, two little items to talk to you about. One is to warn you about something that's really big on the minds of the police department here in Thousand Oaks. We, in, in, at least in my age group, and intuitively I think all of us really like to open our windows and our sliders and all the rest of that to take advantage of the free fresh air that blows in from the ocean regularly and then blows out again in the morning. I caution everyone to remember that don't let your castle become a dangerous place by inviting unwanted critters and people into it, particularly when you sleep and also when you're away. Um, my windows have a device on them that allow me to keep them open, but uh, only limit their opening to six inches. Uh, we need to think in, in those kinds of terms, particularly when you go to bed, and especially if you have sliders that you're intending to leave open. There is a news item this morning also that talks about um, the fact that people with big doggy doors are inviting trouble because some people who are more lithe are getting in through the doggy doors into the house. And in fact, my grandchildren can get through those doggy doors and have on several occasions, much to our chagrin. So that's point one. Please be careful with that. Um, the second thing, we've discussed it before in this venue, 
we need to be very careful and we need to seek outside legal advice before we consider a reverse anything. It began with reverse mortgages. Reverse mortgages may be fine for some uses and for some people in certain situations, but they demand uh, due diligence on our part. I notice that there is a rising uh, wave of reverse instruments. For instance, now it's being touted by Greenlight, I think, a reverse insurance scheme. Please, before you decide to use those uh, kinds of things, anything that begins with reverse, including, I suppose, backing your car out of the garage safely, um, please get do your due diligence and get outside legal help uh, before you involve in one of these things. Um, that intuition on my part comes from uh, a steady diet of walk-in bathtubs and watching the other commercials that occurred during the newscast at 11 o'clock on KABC. Now, the main top of the topic of discussion is this, and it worries me. Some of you know that I was an intelligence officer in another life. Um, and therefore, I keep my ears pricked for interesting things that are happening. It turns out that three years ago, some ne'er-do-wells from um, one of the northeastern European countries decided that they would create a virus that would keep us all from getting onto the Internet. Now, even if you're not shopping, you most of us, including me, uh, have a very big need for the Internet because, frankly, we, we communicate with other people in our age group and with uh, our children and grandchildren, and they probably communicate better than we do. You may have heard that there is something called the DNS server virus. First thing to do is I'm going to be sure that you understand the translation of all of these words. And I'm going to give you an easy website to go to. I suggest that if you feel in, uh, not confident about this, that you go get your local friendly computer expert. And almost everybody in this room has one about 14 years of age handy. <laughs> <laughs> and promise them whatever it is that you as a grandparent do uh, to, uh, to get one of your grandchildren to help you out. <clears throat> so the DNS server virus. DNS means domain name server virus, all right? Um, we all have a name that people address us by on the Internet. For instance, you could call me the old bald blind guy. That would work just fine. Um, you could call a certain staffer the really nice, very good-looking staffer lady, uh, and that would get to her. But it makes it really tough on computers that only deal in ones and zeros still, believe that or not. So every one of us has another name that is a numbered name, and it's a long numbered name. I won't uh, give you my numbered name, but I'll give you one like it and see if you can translate it. It probably would go like this. 74, 117, 65, 171. And that's pretty much in the format that that uh, address comes in. And what I did was I gave you my age, my blood pressure, and my weight. Meaningless, doesn't do any good. Okay. I want you to keep in mind what I'm going to say, and then I'll show you what I'm going to say. D-N-S hyphen O-K dot U-S. D-N-S hyphen O-K dot U-S. S. Now, if you type that into the browser on your computer, what will happen is, hopefully, you'll get a screen that looks like this. D don't pay any attention to that IP in a minute because it doesn't mean what you think it does, and I'll, I'll tell you how to get it. Do you see the color green that surrounds the little people? Hopefully, most of us, all of us, will get that little color green on their computer if you type in DNS 
hyphen okay dot us okay now at the bottom of that little screen right there see the screen it's turned green so you think I don't got to worry about anything else yes we do because there is a variant of how you can get on the internet and if you're getting on the internet that way rather than through something like verizon.net or some other way then you need to go to the link that's at the bottom of this screen that's in purple and this is where you ask your uh, grandchildren to, or some other wise person to help you out before you go there, you got to ask Google, and they work better than anybody else, this simple question, what is my IP? And it'll pop up, and the first line on the answering screen from Google will be your IP address. Write it down very carefully, because if you decide to do this yourself, and you certainly can, you need it, you're going to need to put it in another search window. <clears throat> the person that's helping you will need it also. Otherwise, you probably won't need it again unless you're putting new hardware or something. And as a matter of fact, you may already know what it is. Uh, and, and as I said, in, in this fictitious address that I gave you was uh, 74 uh, 117 65, uh, gosh, I can't remember it all, 174 <laughs> or 171, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like that. It could easily be if it was for somebody else, uh, let's see, these days 28, 44, 26, 36. <laughs> somebody remembered uh, over here what the, uh, what the idealized um, uh, female figure was supposed to look like. <laughs> And including a person who was not cited and who <laughs> just, just demonstrated for us what it is. Okay. If you go to the link that I gave you, you're going to get a screen that won't help you very much. It's long. Right at the bottom of the screen, it says, gives you an instruction, and it's not colored. You tap on that. This is a, a, another check. And you'll know it when you see it. It'll take you to yet another screen that the FBI has set up. And uh, in there, on that screen, you'll see a little box that says IP address. Type in your IP address on there. Hit return, and you're home free. For most of us, I hope, for almost maybe even 100% of us, all you need to remember to do is DNS dot. O, uh, uh, hyphen, 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 okay, dot, U.S., okay? All together, everyone, D-N-S, hyphen, 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 okay? Uh, what, okay, dot, U.S., okay. Uh, if the FBI is listening, I'll give you my last four, 9168, so you can look me up. Please, next time, make this easier. Put all the steps on one screen and give us old folks a break and help us out with this. Yeah, amen. I got an amen from the congregation. Thank you very much. Be safe, everyone. Uh, one little thing that I also heard recently, uh, there's been a rash of, of garage uh, yeah. burglaries. If people, I, I tend to do this sometimes in the daytime, leave my garage door open if I'm going in and out and stuff like that. But that's gotten, uh, that's become fairly popular in the last uh, month or so, I've heard. Okay, thank you very much, Leonard. Uh, we move on to 6C, and that'll have to be uh, saved for next month as our uh, commissioner is not here. So we will not have a, a report this month on fraud. So we'll move now uh, to David. Commissioner Grimm for our liaison reports. Thank you, Jim. Uh, yes, the VC AAA. Nick, you got something for us? Yes. I, today I'd like to focus your attention on a, a new product of the VC AAA and in conjunction with the Ventura County uh, Superior Courts and Gray Law. And that's a handbook called, uh, which they call LIFE, which has the unfortunate, uh, uh, it's an acronym which stands for Legal Information for Elders. 
Um, it provides a lot of useful information on how to deal with the various uh, documents that elders often find themselves faced with, such as wills, uh, advanced care directives, powers of attorney, pulse forms, um, and so on. Um, I say this, the, the name is somewhat unfortunate because I think I have all of these forms and I don't consider myself an elder. Uh, and um, uh, furthermore, I think these forms are as useful to anyone uh, that's a boomer, uh, that's middle-aged, that's young, and so forth, as long as you're over 18, uh, you know, that these are forms you should consider. Um, and um, one of the things that I think that we as seniors uh, can get involved in is trying to promote that notion with our children and our grandchildren, and it behooves us to, to know what we can about the forms, uh, uh, not to treat them as end-of-life forms, as uh, we often think of them as, well, if you think you're dying, you should run out and, and prepare a will and, and um, advance care directive and so forth, because uh, we often can't anticipate that those events, and, and neither can our children or grandchildren. Um, so this becomes sort of a useful handbook for us to become sufficiently informed that we can become good parents and good grandparents and promote uh, uh, wider use of them. The, this uh, handbook went under a f underwent a field test last week in Camarillo. Uh, the next steps are going to be to hold some workshops various places in the counties, uh, in the county, um, and these will probably be held at the senior centers. And if you're interested, you should uh, watch for a w workshop uh, in our area uh, coming up in the near future. Um, and hopefully this will be the first of several similar projects by VCAAA. I understand there's been some talk in their outreach committee about doing a similar one on financial planning. Um, and so there may be other topics in the future, so stay tuned. Thanks a lot. All right, so you'll be the one who keeps us stay tuned, right, Nick, on uh, the progress of I'll this? I'll do my best. All right, my friend, thank you. Um, RSVP, our volunteer who does that, is not here, Marty. So I guess we'll move on to, boy, it looks like we got a buckaroo or a buckaroo S up there. What, it must be Caneo Valley Days coming up or something. What do you got for us on the Global Senior Still Adult Center? <laughs> well, there's lots of things. But first I'm going to um, talk about uh, Relay for Life and the Love Run because those are coming up. And, of course, there's a team out there, um, Young and the rest of us. So there's the Relay for Life, May 19th and 20th. <clears throat> and that same team will also do the Love Run, which helps support senior concerns, and that will be on June 3rd. So if you want to go online and sign up for that, you can go to www.relayforlife.org. Or for the Love Run, it would be www.seniorconcerns.org. And if you're not computer savvy, you can call 805-381-381. 7362 and get some forms or more information. So I thought I'd put that out there since those events are coming up and they're great fundraisers. Uh, as far as May is going for the rest of uh, the Global Senior Adult Center, we have our Pastries and Professors group, which will still be meeting um, May 2nd and 16th, and the second will be um, So Bad They Are Good. So it will be some films that are bad, but then they're really funny. We've all seen some of those. And then on May 16th will be Social Business, Creating a World Without Poverty. So those will be two different people, um, professors from Channel Islands University coming out for that. And those are 6.45 to 8.45 p.m. You do need to call for reservations. I'll give the center number at the end. And also this Saturday, May 6th, we've got the Ms. Senior Canal Valley pageant. So there's lots of things to do this weekend. You've got Canal Valley days. You've got the Senior uh, Canal Valley pageant. It's five dollars, but it is it is really fun to watch all these women um, out there doing their entertainment and their philosophies and their evening gown wear. And it's it's really elegant and quite quite a thing to come to. So we still have tickets for sale. Um, our brain fitness program, we have um, running. It's going to be four weeks, and it's every month, and it's um, through Senior Concerns, taught by T. So you can always sign up for that. It, it is a fee-based class, so it is $62 for the four-week classes, but they run from 3.30 to 5, so that's an hour and a half for four weeks. 
really, really interesting stuff using the day cam, using um, different ways to remember things, uh, laughter, all sorts of good stuff. We will be running the meaning of opera and the fun of it, and that'll be on May 14th and 28th. So on the 14th will be Regaletto, and May 28th will be Comic Relief. And those run from 3.30 to 5. And Betty Berry's doing her next famous, um, will you pass your next driving test? And that'll be on May 22nd from 1 to 3. So if you've got a driver's test coming up, come to the class, but you've got to come to the class in order to get the packets and all the sample tests. So um, definitely get your name on the list for that because those spaces go quick. And then we've got something new also on that same day, the 22nd, it's called Battle for Veterans 2012. This is a very active group doing a variety of um, variety of things all throughout the Caneo Valley and doing fundraisers. So they're calling all veterans um, from all the armed forces and their families. And it'll be from 6.30 to 8. And it'll it's building up to an evening of honor. And then there's also some fundraising events that'll be at Westlake High School and the football team and whatnot. So this one, though, if you do have questions about it, you do want to call 818-262-8689. And so that's 818-262-8689. Um, I also talked about the, the love run there, um, all that good stuff. But don't forget, Betty Berry has her brigade. So she's got a, a one-mile fun walk. You might have heard that at the beginning. So if you uh, want to do that, Call 805-495-6250. And on June 6th, we will be doing a volunteers and policing program. So if you want to learn about the volunteers and policing program and who they are and what they do, um, come on in. You're going to listen to a um, VIP member speak about it and uh, call for seating reservations. We have quite a few of our seniors from the center and all throughout the community really helping do a lot of things. So when you see minor traffic accidents and you see a VIP car or a truck, they're actually doing some of the legwork so the regular police men and women can be out doing some other things when it is minor traffic stuff. And we are starting a healthier living class, and that'll be Thursdays, June 7th through July 12th from 9.30 to 11. It is a free program that's offered through SCAN and also by Brenda Birdwell with Senior Concerns. However, you do need to speak with Brenda before um, you join in on the class because there are some criteria that they need to gather. So if you're interested in that, call 805 Four nine five six two five zero and ask for Brenda. And we've got a new class that will be starting up this summer too. Writing is healing. So those are some new things coming up. We've got our new trips coming for this month. And uh, Sizzlin' Movie Musicals and at the Laughlin Luau, you'll be able to sign up for those on May 11th. And we still have some of our other day trips still open. I think there's some for Pachanga, um, Showtime Cabaret Castaways, Lake Arrowhead Alpine Cooler, and we do have an Escondido Overnight with the San Diego Wild Animal Park and Paula Casino. So we're trying to combine everybody who likes to gamble and everybody who wants to go to San Diego and go to the Zoo or the Wild Animal Park. So hopefully we'll, we'll <coughs> gather all those people together. So that's what's coming up trip-wise. And then since it is going to be summer, we are already taking registration for um, our contract classes through CRPD, Canal Recreation and Park District, in which we do have a few at the center ourselves, which is golf lessons, Hatha Yoga, a regular yoga, Zumba Gold, and Zumba Gold Toning. And then we also have a digital camera class, Facebook Made Easy, if you've got an iPhone or an iPad from one of your younger relatives and you don't know what really to do with it, uh, come to the iPhone iPad class and, and learn about all the cool things you can do with it. Also, Microsoft Word and Beyond the Basics Internet and Beyond the Basics Email. Because we all do simple stuff, but then we start finding we want to know more and we know we can do more, we just don't know how to do it. So these classes will go through some of the other simpler things beyond your basics. So those are the um, newer classes that are coming up. And I think that's about it. Any questions? Just a second. I mean, the 
Council of Aging has been a big promoter of the um, Miss Senior California. Also, it's Caneo Valley Day. Is, uh, is a senior center going to be able to block the, off the parking areas so that That's our That's what I'm going to do. Good girl. All right. <laughs> glad, glad to hear you're already on that. Whew. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. I know that'll, that'll be funny. Anything else? Yes. You mentioned the class on iPhone, iPad usage and so forth. Does the senior center have Wi-Fi for? Yes, we do. Okay. It just, it's mostly from the center of the building uh, west. The east end, it doesn't quite make it. So once you get past the front desk. <laughs> okay. So between the teen or the end of our building from like the teen center to the front desk, so front and back lobby and those rooms and right and around that there, class you're will be fine. Held on the west side. So the whole okay. west end is is good. The east end, not so much. Thank you, Andrea. All right, let's move on to uh, agenda item number eight: special event announcements. Uh, Rita, do you have something on the? Uh... Yes, I have. Uh, the Senior of the Year dinner and awards ceremony is going to be held on June seventh, and it's at five thirty p.m. It includes dinner. We have an entertainment uh, committee, and uh, we have a juggler called David Cousins, who's coming in to entertain. The highlight will be the dinner by Stone Fire Grill. Um, I have to tell you, it's chicken and mashed potatoes and Caesar salad, and the dessert is a very big surprise. Um, we have four nominated people, and five altogether, sorry. Uh, I'll name them for you so you'll... Uh, begin to know that these people are ready. Uh, one is Ed Huffschmidt from DART. Second is Barbara Lingens from Senior Concerns. Tony Miller from Ship Ahoy. Eugene Nestor from United Blood Services. And Jerry Trail from Friends of the Library. Uh, we really want to urge you to come see these uh, volunteers who do a great deal for us. Uh, we have many sponsors, and they're uh, footing the bill for this. Uh, among them, the uh, Cabrillo Music Theater, the Stonefire Grill, the Goebel Center, of course, uh, is included. And then we have retired senior and volunteers, uh, the Conejo Rec Department, the City of Thousand Oaks, the Civic Arts Plaza Foundation, and for any information on this particular dinner, we have the Council on Aging number, and we hope you'll ask us. Uh, the number is 805-381-7362. We do have uh, tickets available at the Goebel Senior Center. Uh, they're considered a $6 donation because these seniors uh, need to be honored in this way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we might add that uh, for any of you out there, we are still accepting donations for door prizes, et cetera, for the event. It's really uh, one, of the, one of the grand things we get to do every year to recognize these incredible people who give so very much of themselves to, to make certain that our lives are a little bit better. So all of your support would be appreciated. We hope to see you all out there. Uh, we move on to item number nine, commissioner comments. David. Thank you again, Jim. Um, I just wanted to thank some of the new and old faces who have come to join us here at our telecast. I, I hope you got a better appreciation from you new folks what we're, we're about here. And I hope you look seriously into becoming a volunteer. I think Jim's speech sort of gave you an idea of, of how that good feeling can come over you by helping someone else. And we are a marvelous vehicle to get that good feeling rolling. Thank you, Jim. Anyone else? Hey, Harry? Yes. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Jim. Uh, the next edition of the Senior Buzz is out, and I hope you all We'll get a chance to pick one up at the library, the senior center, or at some of the doctor's offices around town. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Harry, for everything you do to put that out. Any other commissioner comments? 
Well then. The absence of two of our commissioners, Nancy and, and uh, Marty, were on health uh, issues, and we so hope that they and their families are coming through well and look forward to them getting back in the fold again. Thanks, Jim. Good. All right. If there is no more business before this council, this meeting is adjourned.